okay. <laughs> I am recording and the sneeze has disappeared. So it'll come back about 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, hello and welcome to what I grandly call my study. Um, it's basically a bookshelf. I used to live in a vicarage and I, I really long for the days of a study, but I live in a small rented house in Oxford and this is now my study. So welcome, I'm Katie Tupling, and I'm really, really pleased to actually meet in person rather than just down the end of a telephone. Carol, yay! Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi. And I was saying to you, Carol, before we started recording, that it looks like you've got a World War I trench coat looming over your shoulder, just keeping an eye on you. Have you got your own bodyguard? Oh, that would be good. No, no need for a bodyguard. It's actually my clothes hanging up at the end of my bed because I'm in my <laughs> home office and, and it's a strategically placed there. So you can't see the mess on my chest of drawers or anybody coming in to the room. <laughs> <laughs> I was say, the whole trench coat appearance and the medals. I'm thinking, does she basically live like in a World War One <laughs> trench? No, I'm afraid not. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, tell us who you do live with, how your household is, and how you're operating your ministry before the dreaded COVID came along. Well, I'm based in Shrewsbury at the United Reformed Church in Shrewsbury. I've been here a couple of years now, so I do feel I've got to know the area a little bit. Um, and as a URC minister, it's very, very varied and broad. Um, ministry is great. I would do nothing else. It, it, you know, it's a, such a strong sense of call and to be here at this time as well. So Shrewsbury United Reformed Church um, is one of the biggest numerically in the, in the United Reformed Church. We've got about 180 members wow. um, right in the middle of the centre of Shrewsbury. There's a, a loop and we're right on the English bridge of the loop. Um, big premises, so a really busy building, lots of outside bookings, lots of church activities and, and groups going on. Um, many going on with and without me to be fair <laughs> there's some lovely people there um, so my ministry very much is what I would call a traditional ministry of, of pastoral care of some management um, of the, the premises with others um, supporting others as they do their ministries um, as well as looking out towards um, our, our outreach such as Messy Church and Messy Vintage where I, I, I have a role um, but I'm also supporting those people who, who have started those groups and, and encouraging them. So it's a whole mixed bag. I wouldn't say it was any one thing all the time. Um, busy, very busy. There's lots going on, um, but really enjoyable at that route down. And uh, we work with an elders team, an elders meeting. And so I, I feel very much that I'm part of a team. I'm one of the elders meeting set apart to be the minister within that. Um, and that comes across really well. So that's um, the church life. Um, personal life I'm at home now I've got two children who are two girls eight and ten mm -hmm. and um, a husband called Rob and um, Rob is why we're shielding he has um, in, takes immunosuppressant drugs for his psoriasis so it's not an obvious thing and he's a very relatively fit and healthy bloke <laughs> yeah. um, but he is um, brought low immune wise um, with these drugs that he's been on for many many years yeah. um, as well as a, a past diagnosis of asthma so we got the letter and um, the letter didn't come until about three weeks after we'd started shielding, to be fair. <laughs> um, but we'd already <laughs> yes. realised and, and presumed that he would be in that category because all the drugs that he's been on, there's always been warnings, you know, not to go near people. One drug was not to go near people who had um, measles or um, shingles. Another one was not to be near anybody who had TB. I don't know how we're meant to know these things, but... Um, they near yeah, cows. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> And so, yeah, we, we've presumed that we would be in that category. And so when the phone call and the letter came, we weren't overly surprised. Um, by that point, we'd already hit a routine. Um, lots of people talk about, you know, striving on. Um, we hit a plod quite quickly and we've stayed <laughs> at that plod. <laughs> I like that. We hit, we hit a shielding plod. How's it been for yeah. your girls? Because they're, they're at an interesting age where they're kind of, they're not little enough to have it pass them by, but they're not old enough to necessarily have the kind of pre-hormonal angst. So how have they found it? Well, they've, they've been amazing. I have to give them credit for, for their, their resilience, really. Um, they're both really different characters. So one of them is desperate to see her friends and has a lot of energy and always has had a problem with keeping still and her hands to herself and all the rest of it. One of those, the youngest one, funnily enough, I was the youngest of two and I don't know where she gets it from. Um, and so she, she struggled a bit. She's wanted to go out a little bit more, but she won't walk past parks because she wants to go on the parks and she's not allowed to. Um, the older one, I think she'd be quite happy in her bubble forever. She's no desire to go and see anybody. She didn't go leave the house um, at all. 
um, for about four or five weeks because we started off trying to make them go for healthy walks and it was so awful we just gave up because what there's no awful? point oh I don't want to go it's not nice and just basically being really stroppy and argumentative which isn't really them they're not that kind of children but they clearly didn't want to go so um, we dropped that and instead we've, we've got lots of things in the back garden. Um, so we've got hockey sticks, we've got badminton net, um, we've got football, we've got a skipping rope out when we haven't got the badminton net out. So we've been trying to keep active, um, but they have, they've really settled well into the not going out and going anywhere because each time you do, there's a risk involved. And they, they know that we are shielding daddy. Sure. So do you go out um, at all? Having... How's, your, how's your ministry been impacted by having to remain at home and operate from a small space in a corner of a house? Um, we, I go out for, for shopping once, once every 10 days. We've managed to work out how to shop for 10 days. And I go to my local co-op shop um, and we get everything we need for 10 days in that one shop. And then occasionally I might pick up a meat delivery because my husband's a butcher and he's quite fussy on what we eat when it comes to meat. Um, so when when our local farm shop reopened we started getting a pickup delivery from men so I literally walk in pick up the box and leave um, and then the only other thing that I've been out going out for um, apart from early morning or late night dog walks yeah and um, where you see nobody um, and my husband when he goes he won't go over a stile he won't go through a gate he will only walk on the streets whereas I, I, I will go over a stile because I like the, where it goes to and then come home and wash my hands yeah. Um, he, he's been really absolute about that. And he tends to go about half six in the morning when he doesn't see anybody. Um, the, so the only thing I've been going out for is funerals. Ah, um, oh, yes, your famous family morning out to Wrexham to go to the Creme. Tell us more about that. <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, over, as a URC minister, um, it's really patchy how many funerals you do. Um, I've had 10 times more funerals than I would normally have. Um, really and that's because often I will only get the people from my church because we have so many Anglican churches around and if they want to be they go to the Anglican church so um I as I'm also as well as the Shrewsbury minister I'm also the Shropshire area minister minister for 20 percent of my time so I have a, a vague oversight over the whole of Shropshire um, and, and part of the structures if they need any help or if they um, are looking for ministry I make that process and hopefully ease that process a little bit so as my area role, um, I have become the only person in Shropshire who can do funerals at the moment because of pe other people shielding. So I'm the only stipendary minister in Shropshire and then I have two non-stipendaries who are shielding or, or way over 80. Um, and so if anybody dies, and, and for some reason there's been a run of people wanting funerals from a United Reformed Church minister across the county. Um, so I've been up to Wrexham a couple of times, hurt my shoulder. So the only way to get there was for my husband to drive me. And it's the first time we've been out for eight weeks. And so we piled the girls in the car. One of them packed a bag with a blanket and some snacks and her book. <laughs> um, and we piled in the car. We drove across the border into Wales, wondering if we were going to get stopped. And I did the, the funeral at the beautiful Wrexham crematorium and they all sat in the car and waited they didn't even get out and have a walk in the sunshine though they could have done very easily um, and then we all got back in the car drove home via Marks and Spencer's at a petrol station and had an ice cream and that was our day out what did you do in lockdown we, we went to Wrexham oh it's lovely there isn't it I don't know we were in the creme <laughs> but it was it was really interesting just to be out because um of course the seasons changed since we've been in lockdown so yeah. the road that they're very familiar with because i ministered in oswald street previously to this um they they hadn't seen since december say and suddenly there's there's yellow fields and everything's green and the plants are growing and and so yeah they they were like rediscovering the world it was amazing <laughs> I know what you mean. We took my son, um, this sounds very middle class, but forgive me, it is a cost we're going to do, not the middle classness, the cost of the, the riding lessons. We took him for his first riding lesson this morning in three months. His last one was May the 7th, uh, March 17th. And, um, and we sat there watching him. It was all socially distanced. It was all anti-back everywhere. It was only him in his lesson with his tutor and we had to help pull the kit and stuff on all the saddle and that. And um, we sat watching him. We kind of like, really distracted by things in the rafters and it was um, um, house martins who, who were busy doing all their thing and we suddenly realized that when we had gone there in March um, there had been they were maybe just building their nests at that point and having that three month gap we suddenly realized that they were now dismantling the nests to go because they'd done the whole lay the eggs nurture the eggs 
crack open the eggs, the babies come out. I don't really have birds work, obviously. Um, they've done the whole process of fledglings and the fledglings are gone and they were now planning on going. And we're like, we have missed a whole, a whole season, season of change. It was just really weird. Yeah. And I think in the church, that season mix, that missing, has been quite interesting because um, we, ministry has changed, obviously. The first eight weeks, I seem to spend a lot of time at my desk. I'm now paying for that with a bad back. But, um, and it was about producing things so that people didn't feel like they were alone or they, they could access worship in a way that was helpful. And so we've taken a very much a kind of a two or three pronged. At first, it was just on paper. The week before lockdown, I managed to print off all the things we were going to do in Lent and made it into a booklet and said, look, take one of these so that if we don't get to meet again, you've got something to start with. <laughs> just in and case. Yeah, and we didn't. And then people were looking at me as if to go, no, don't be daft. And I'm like, just in case. I had all the material for the Lent groups anyway, so made it into a booklet and off they went. And then it happened. So that week, first Sunday out, we were covered. Um, and then we, we started trying to introduce, I looked at all the different formats and uh, for a church that tries to be so inclusive and welcoming, we really hadn't grappled with um, with the online stuff because mm -hmm. it's, it, it's one of many things and you put your your energy to where you can and some of them just seem beyond you. But actually, we've all proven that we can do it. Can be done. But I couldn't do it if I was doing everything I was doing before. So mm -hmm. it's about priorities. So yes, we, we're really accessible and level and all the rest of it. And we've got all the right loops and we've got all the right visual things and we've got a sign and we use Makaton and all these kind of things, but we hadn't mastered the online. So we decided to have a trial on Palm Sunday and try a Zoom service. And I was amazed at how emotional it made me feel yeah. seeing everybody after kind of three weeks. Um, and they're absolute, you can see the delight in their faces of seeing each other as well. Um, and so we, we started a, a tradition of, of, of Zooming and Facebook Live reflection, not a service, because um, it felt right to be a reflection. And we do it early on a Sunday. And so all, over the last couple of weeks or months, what we've done is developed a pattern of how that can work. So if people aren't online, they get the service in, on paper with their newsletter at the beginning of the month. And then that, that paper one gets expanded for the one every week. So there is a link. So everyone's sort of on the same material, but if you're live, you get more um, because you get it more kind of spoken rather than read. Yeah. And it means that the, the other clergy and the other um, lay preachers can join in as well. They plan some of them and help deliver them on that. Brilliant. But that has become a really big focus, um, which was fine for the first few weeks. And then you start going, but what about everything else? And it's just like in ministry, maybe there's a pattern of Sunday to Sunday, yeah. but all these suddenly I'm to create new experiences to try and link people together. Um, where they needed it so it has changed ministry it, it's wonderful having proper conversations with people you know and I think about a church coffee morning and you you start a conversation and then somebody hovers and then you can't quite say what you wanted to say to that person because they're listening even if they try not to so you yeah. can't really ask the person well well how are you properly yeah. and then they kind of drift off and the next one drifts in and then somebody and, and all that kind of interweaving which kind of works whereas mm. now if I want to speak to somebody I pick up the phone and I start a conversation, we say what needs to be said, and then we have a proper goodbye. Yeah. And that's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. So in that sense, I think ministry has become pa more pastoral because I've not had as many meetings. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we've now worked out through the wonders of Zoom how to do coffee mornings where we and after yeah. church and during the week where I can break people down to random groups. Yeah. Now, a church of 180 people, they don't all know each other. They don't know each other's names. They don't know anything about each other, some of them. No matter how friendly they are as a church, it's just too many people. So if you're randomly put in a room of four people, you get to more, know more people. And what's great is that down at the bottom, you've got your name. I know, so you haven't got to go, and your name is? It's like, oh, I can see your name just there. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So there's been some real positive bits to ministry. Um, but at every point, I'm conscious of those who are going out and those who aren't those who are really vulnerable and suffering well-being wise and those who are thriving in lockdown who are talking about wonderful gardens and how great it is that they're getting everything done because they know when it's over usual life will carry on and this will have just been a blip that's actually been really relaxing um right the way through to people with mental health issues whose whose bipolar is oof, mm -hmm. and whose depression is is you know it's just such a mix but i think it's more open because people are having to say it yes so my 85 year old i call her my evangelist 
um, who lives in a, a complex, an old people's complex, and she goes round and she is just so godly in those places, but has bipolar and has been really down. Um, she's been telling me that, whereas in the past I've had to guess it. Sure. There's a vulnerability that people are more willing to be vulnerable and be honest about how they are and where they are. Mm, yeah, and it's led to some much better and more wholesome conversations, I think. Um, do you feel, um, I've been talking a lot to a lot of the Anglican clergy so far, so it's nice to get a URC perspective and off camera we talked quite a lot um, with the Anglicans about kind of support levels, uh, not just kind of from uh, teams or lay ministry or kind of elders and stuff, um, PCCs obviously in the Anglican system, but uh, from the Anglican point of view, sort of archdeacons and bishops and the system. Um, and we had some very frank discussions off camera and didn't ask the question on camera for what would become apparent the obvious reasons. Um, I wonder from the URC point of view whether you feel supported and how that support has come from where? I feel very supported by my local church. I really do. I, am, I feel very cherished um, by my local church and um, that, that's through emails or conversations that's through the number of cards I've had which it, I'm not a child I don't need to have a card to tell me that they like me but it does make you feel good and if you're on a bad day just some just knowing that somebody's put pen to paper so I feel really cherished um, by my, my local folk and the elders um, in particular I've got some wonderful officers my secretary and treasurer are just worth their weight in, in gold in every way so I think I feel totally supported by them um, I, there's a part of my personality that is always going to look and kind of go at the end of this what will the criticism be and how can I mitigate that now what what haven't we done what have we done badly um, and I feel like I've got to a point where that isn't the question anymore because I think the level of support and enthusiasm says that whatever is said at the end of this as we look back on it I think I, I will be in a good place so because of the support I've had that that's where we're at so yes, we haven't done everything perfect and there's more and different things we may have chosen to do, but I feel we've chosen together supporting one another. So in that sense, I don't feel vulnerable going into the future. Mm. Um, from our wider structures, it's tricky because in Shropshire, we're such a rural county. Mm. I am the support structure if I had any other ministers. Okay. So um, I've been trying to support my non-stipendary ministers and my retired ministers and my widows, which is part of my role. So um, I, I don't necessarily feel they've in any way supported me um because i'm meant to be their support yeah. network yeah. Yeah. where i would say that's changed is one retired no two retired ministers within my own congregation who i have this wider responsibility for who after one after every zoom service one will send me a text just saying thank you um, and the, and they will do anything i ask if i ask them to do midweek reflections and all that kind of stuff they will so practically supportive from the wider church it's slightly different um i feel i could contact my moderator anytime and I have, and he will respond. Um, and he's done an occasional check of me because we're in other meetings, so he can see that things are okay. Um, but I do feel that if I, in fact, I did write to him just yesterday and say I need to run something by you, and he's made time for me to do that. So I think um, synod wise, if I had a problem and I told them I had a problem, they'd respond. Yeah. Nationally, um, I'm really quite impressed with the URC. I don't often say that about our national structures because they feel they feel a long way away. Yeah. Not because they're not good, it's just that they feel. But our communications department has been amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and they have produced really handy documents about all the different forms of technology and of funerals, virtual funerals and um, new normal. And they have act really good quality documents. I've never known it to be as good. Well, um, to Google your stuff in that case. <laughs> Yeah, do. And not only that, one of the ladies in the communications department has done loads of colouring images of Bible verses that you can download and colour. They've thought about the spiritual side as well as the practical side. So um, <laughs> yeah, whilst I haven't really engaged very much in the offering of the worship that they provided from the URC nationally, I think the rest of it, they have been really supportive to, to clergy. Brilliant. Yeah. OK, now here's a slightly trickier question, or maybe it, it's the most easy one I'm going to ask you. Um, God, I've got to mention the G word because, you know, we are we are uh, ministers. So I should do this um, where or how or has 
God been in this whole pre, during and post COVID stuff? Where's God been in the ministry and the shielding and, and the home life and just being close to you or, or far away? Knowing that something like this was going to come up, I've done a bit of thinking, if I'm honest. <laughs> and I think before lockdown, um, of course, um, God is there in, the, in my ministry and in our fellowship. But I have to say that I think God was quite quiet and a little bit stale, maybe, because there was a routine where we managed to squeeze every element of spontaneity and spirit out um, <laughs> often <laughs> um, by over programming and being too busy um, and just being kind of magnets of meetings. So I think what the COVID time has done has kind of shaken that to the core because nothing is normal. Sure. Um, and that meant that where I was getting my spiritual food from, which is often um, my preparation for worship and delving into the word for the sermon and creating the service and the prayers, suddenly didn't exist anymore. It was five services in a booklet that I could send out six weeks before I started them. Um, we'll get to the end. So, you know, I got to predict where we're going to be at the end of June, halfway through May. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'd say that first of all it shook it very much um and i felt really dry the first six to eight weeks i felt like i was being some kind of god vessel for others who were being really enthusiastic and appreciative but it was just leaving me really cold sure. um it was like an academic exercise yeah. um didn't mean i didn't enjoy it didn't mean i didn't get anything from it but it was it was kind of hitting the head not the heart yeah um so on realizing that i started trying to do a little bit more um, of my own so i started trying to put more of a pattern of morning and evening prayer in um, and in doing that produce something for my folk to then follow if they wanted to as well um, and that's helped as has deliberately um, trying to challenge myself um, with some reading about what other people think because i realized again i'm due in september to start an ma because i want to challenge myself academically and in my thinking yeah. Um, and I thought, well, why wait until September? You know, get on it. Do it now. You've got time. <laughs> You've got time on your hands. Um, yeah. So I think I, at this moment in time, I come out of, or so we start emerging from lockdown in whatever form and time scale that will be. Um, I feel a little bit more prayerful, but I feel my people are more prayerful too. Um, I feel a little bit more appreciative of the blessings um, because so much has been taken away. And when it gets pared back down, what's left is still a blessing. And, and that is the time with my family. That is the conversations I mentioned. Um, and I can see how God has put them in the right time and the right places. And if that's happening to all my church folk as well and all the other people of faith, then that Kairos moment, that God's using these moments that have just been thrown up into the air. And when they land, they're going to be different. We're going to be different people. Yeah. And that's a bit scary. It is, because, isn't it? <laughs> yeah different can be good and different can be just terrifying but yeah. um if surely if it's if this is the kairos moment for god and for the church and for us then we should be really excited we, we, should. we should we should so although the holy I'm, spirit has a, has a nasty habit of sweeping through and making big changes and you're like okay pentecost here we go <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so i mean i guess there's an inevitable anxiety um about the the next bit but I've decided to put that in a box and when it gets to that point, I'll worry about it then. Sounds very so, sensible. So, yeah, going from, from a very cool start and a very dry, arid place, I feel it's slightly better um, and there's slightly more. And, and having conversations with people like yourself and others has, has, has emerged in the last few weeks, which weren't there at the beginning when everyone was just like, you know, running around. I'm trying to think of a polite phrase that doesn't involve a fly here, but, um, you know... <laughs> um you know <laughs> running around like head, just chicken, headless chickens there we go that's the oh, one um, <laughs> yeah um so yeah so it's a bit calmer now okay now we're coming towards the end of our time not for covid i have no idea how long that's going to last but our time in our conversation so i wonder what are the kind of the top tips you might have things that you've put in place that have helped you either family or ministry or personally or, or any of those uh top tips that you've had for not just surviving the shielding process but thriving in it that you could recommend to other people i think on a personal level i would say it is a, um my one of my top tips would be treats um, um i think everybody at times needs a treat and so we have treated ourselves and it doesn't necessarily mean it's been a monetary value treat 
know some of them have like whether it's an afternoon tea or or getting a bunch of flowers whatever it is but not just for, for us but for others so tr I think that kind of moment of joy when you you know that somebody's happy because you've treated them as well so I'd say one of my top tips is actually to deliberately and intentionally have moments of treat yeah. um, and if that's going for a walk around a particular field then that's a treat mm -hmm. if that's playing a particular board game that's a treat um, if that's getting afternoon tea delivered to our front door which we did um, that's a treat um, you know so I think that one of mine would be treats for ourselves and for others um, definitely very early on um, I felt unjustifiably that somebody sent quite a harsh email to me and it devastated me for about well a couple of hours it sounds silly until I put it into perspective so I say one of my other top tips is that we have to hear the good um, in perspective with the constructive um, and make a positive choice not to dwell on the one that we inevitably are drawn to as it was the person who made that first comment is now the absolutely most biggest supporter of our online worship and all the rest of it yeah. Um, but I think she was in a bad place so I think having grace to other people and hoping they will have grace to me if I'm having a, a bad day um, is my other one is so to put the good and the bad together and actually put it in perspective and sometimes you have to be really harsh with yourself to do that you do um, quite discipline yeah yeah so I'd say that one and then there was a final one top tips um everything can wait Mm -hmm. The other day, my computer started playing up, so I turned it off and I walked away. Oh, most right. things can That's wait. Quite brave. <laughs> yeah, most things actually, most things can wait, and sometimes things should wait. And if it's because my girls want to play a board game, most things can wait. Um, sometimes I recognise they can't, but I, I think one of the things I've learned is about um, priorities, and some things are good to wait. So they would be my top tips. Well, thank you very much. Well, I'm going to hover my finger over the stop record button, but hopefully, unlike Addy the other day, who's about to go live, or by, by the time this goes live, she'll have already gone live. Um, I, I was hovering over the stop record button and doing my final thank yous, and without realising, I've got really bad proprioception, so if I can't see where my hands are, I don't quite know what they're doing. Um, so I managed to cut her off if she was saying thank you for having me, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> I appear to have just stopped recording. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm going to get it in. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm getting it in before you do. Before I completely make an ass of doing the stop button. See, I don't mind saying ass. Um, so, Carol, it's been <laughs> lovely to actually meet you properly, not just a voice down the telephone line. And thank you for being here and being one of my interviewees. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> you can come well, me up You're welcome. <laughs> um, and please make sure you stay alive and we'll meet one day, you know, in the same physical space. Yay. <laughs>